to this new podcast produced by the Institute for European Environmental Policy. My name is Gabrielle Aubert, working as a policy analyst in the biodiversity team. As a not-for-profit organization with over 40 years of experience, IEP is advancing impact-driven sustainability policy across the EU and the world. Established in 2019, IEP's network of think tanks, Think Sustainable Europe, informs and engages policymakers at member state and EU level about key environmental sustainability debates. COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity has just started, and during this exchange, we will try to untangle the many complex discussions and give a lucid overview of what this event means for biodiversity and people globally. During the two weeks of negotiations, parties to the CBD will negotiate the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, GBF, which defines targets and pathways for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. COP15 was originally scheduled to take place in Kunming, China, in October 2020, a year that had been labeled the super year for biodiversity. The COP was, however, postponed two times because of the COVID-19 pandemic and had to be relocated to Montreal. These delays and other major events since then, mainly the Russian invasion of Ukraine, have put a strain on the COP negotiations and have put biodiversity conservation on the back burner. Since October 2020, there have been working group meetings in Geneva, Nairobi, but these last round of negotiations have shown a lack of political commitment to robust targets to reverse biodiversity loss in the next decade. COP15 is therefore the last round of negotiations to make that happen. We have a lot to cover, so let's dive in. Today, I'm joined by a panel of experts from the Think Sustainable Europe Network, um, David Bedker uh, and Romana Brzezowska. So David Bedker is a research associate at TM Gear Research, um, a specialist in land rights. David spent five years in the Netherlands where he was a land rights advisor for the international relief and recovery organization, ZOA. His previous professional experience, as well as his studies, unfolded in Berlin, where he studied political science and worked in non-formal political education. He has a PhD from the Free University Berlin. For his doctoral studies, David conducted research on redistributive land reforms in India and South Africa. We are also joined by Romana Brzezowska, a research fellow at AMO. She's currently focusing on climate change in wider contexts, especially in relation to global climate negotiations, climate security, climate diplomacy and just resilience, including EU climate policies and its impacts on different groups of people. During the Czech presidency of the Council of the EU, Romana is working for the Ministry of the Environment in the field of implementation of EU commitments under the Convention on Biological Diversity, specifically on the biodiversity and climate change nexus. My first question is um, about COP15. So we have heard a lot uh, in November about the COP27, so the climate COP. Um, we've also heard about a feeling of disappointment about the outcome of the negotiations. First, I'm turning to David. Um, according to you, is there a link between COP15 and COP27? And also, why is COP15 sorry, such a crucial moment for biodiversity? Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. Um, I think there are actually many links. Definitely, if we don't do something about biodiversity loss than anything we do relating to climate change will not be very meaningful for, for all the beings on this planet. But I want to highlight a very specific link that is very crucial for our own work as TMG, which is the aspect of land governance as a key basis for achieving the targets related to halting biodiversity loss, but also to getting to a turnaround on climate change. I think secure land tenure specifically for indigenous peoples and local communities is really at the heart of the ambitions and, and the work related to the objectives of all three Rio conventions in the end. And I think that this fact is slowly getting more attention across the three Rio conventions. Um, the UNCCD, already recognized land tenure as a key element of their work, but also at the Climate COP, there was now more explicit commitment to supporting indigenous peoples, local communities to protect their land tenure as a basis for doing the work of halting climate change. And I think at the Biodiversity COP, 
we're also getting more attention for this specific element and the global biodiversity framework in its current draft reflects that. I think very generally, there is a very urgent need for rights-based approaches and there's a need to fairly compensate those who have contributed least to the different crises that we're in and to involve local communities, indigenous peoples um, in the efforts at turning around regarding climate change, regarding biodiversity. And one last point, I think for all these issues we're, we're tackling here, the, the window of opportunity, the time window we still have to make meaningful change, to halt that biodiversity loss, to at least mitigate the worst developments regarding to climate change, that window of opportunity is, is rapidly closing. Thank you very much. Um, Romana, do you have a take on this link between COP15 and COP27 and the Rio conventions? Sure, Gabrielle, thank you. So, um, as you said, COP27 definitely was a defensive COP, but there were some breakthroughs, some firsts in relation to biodiversity. Um, for instance, it was the first time that a cover decision, the Sharm al Sheikh implementation plan in this case, included such words like rivers, nature based solutions, tipping points, or the right to a healthy environment, and even two paragraphs under the new heading forest, in which parties agreed to try to collectively halt and reverse forest loss by 2030, and also implement so-called nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches. And this may not sound like a lot, but in the negotiations world, which spins very slowly, it is a breakthrough. We see some acknowledgement that the climate crisis simply cannot be tackled without addressing biodiversity loss, even though a direct reference to COP15 is missing. And in the context of COP15, the linkage to climate change is perhaps a bit stronger. One of the main targets to be negotiated at COP15 focuses explicitly on the need to minimize the impacts of climate change on biodiversity and increase its resilience uh, through, again, nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches. And of course, many say that here in Montreal, a Paris Agreement for Biodiversity should be negotiated, as thanks to the Paris Agreement, climate action received a lot of momentum and political and media attention. So the expectations surrounding the adoption of a post-2020 global biodiversity framework are quite high, as in light of the latest science, um, a lot is at stake. Great. Thank you very much, Romana. Uh, it's great to see that uh, we're building on synergies and that um, it, we're making progress. Um, that makes me turn to uh, the post-2020 global framework for biodiversity that David uh, mentioned. So it's at the heart of the negotiations in, in COP15. And so I want to know from both of you, um, what is it, first of all, very quickly, but also, more importantly, why you think it can do better than the previous framework. So the previous framework were the IG targets for biodiversity that had been set in 2010 up to 2020. None of the targets have been achieved, um, but now we actually have an opportunity um, to build a better framework with better targets for biodiversity. So Romana, maybe you can start. Yeah, so the post-2020 global biodiversity framework uh, replaces the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011 to 2020 and its associated IG targets and the GBF uh, as it's called um, should simply pave the way to aspirational goals for 2050 but it should also contain more action-oriented targets to be reached by 2030 and which should be somewhat measurable to see how well or badly the parties are doing um, and these targets are quite diverse they range from lowering the rate of extinction to dealing with um, human wildlife conflict, for instance, or, or to reducing uh, pollution. Uh, and I think that at the moment, it's not really possible to say whether the GBF will do better or whether it will um, even be ambitious enough from the start. Uh, what does inspire hope, perhaps, is the fact that there will be more political will to actually implement the targets, um, as perhaps the world is now accustomed to the Paris Agreement and so is as if ready for another overarching global agreement, let's say. Um, but of course, the framework will only be successful if parties can take ownership of it and really feel like they have been treated fairly in the process. And they also must be leaving Canada with the feeling that even if they haven't got 
or haven't gained everything they wanted in the negotiations or from the negotiations, they did achieve at least something that could be presented um, as a success. Um, David, do you have anything to add or to complement uh, Romana's analysis? Yeah, maybe one or two little things. I mean, Romana already mentioned the crucial term Paris Agreement for biodiversity. I think getting something that inspires people, societies and policymakers to really ramp up our efforts regarding um, halting biodiversity loss, that, that would be crucial. And if it, if it were to be achieved at this COP, I mean, that would obviously be a, a significant milestone. And I think the current draft of the, of the GBF, that at least really reflects a stronger realization of the need to consider people as key to getting where we want to get, um, but also to consider rights-based approaches um, as key to, to making progress. And I think an agreement that could really facilitate a strong role of those people who are actually involved in protecting and restoring biodiversity on the ground, that would definitely give an edge to, 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 such, a, to such a framework and create momentum to achieve the targets. So I think even if policymakers um, are struggling maybe at the moment to come to an agreement, I think people on the ground, civil society and, and all the countries represented at the COP, they are ready for for something bigger, for something inspiring. So it's it's up to the negotiators now to to come up with something that that inspires all of us. Thank you very much uh, for your very interesting take. I'm now going to focus more on the negotiations um, themselves and turning to the EU more specifically. The EU traditionally plays a very important role in the negotiations of international treaties. And it usually sets very high environmental ambitions. Um, so, Romana, um, we're very lucky to have you here uh, because you've worked very closely with the Czech presidency and uh, you're following the negotiations in Montreal. Um, my question to you is, with what ambitions it, is the EU heading um, to Montreal to the negotiations from the perspective of the Czech presidency? So, well, when we look at the council conclusions adopted at the end of October, the EU does seem to be quite ambitious. The EU really asks for quite a list of elements and it's not possible for me now to mention all of them, but I'll just try to uh, mention a few. Um, and firstly, for instance, the EU calls for transformative action, but specifically it calls, for instance, for effectively conserving at least 30% of global land and at least 30% of oceans. And this is the, the so-called 30 by 30 target. Um, the EU also calls for the restoration of 3 billion hectares of degraded land and freshwater ecosystems, and also 3 billion hectares of ocean ecosystems. It further calls, for instance, for harnessing the full potential of nature-based solutions, a significant reduction of pollution from all sources, the reduction of the rate of introduction and establishment of invasive alien species, um, and so on. And there are also a couple of cross-cutting principles that should apply. All of the above that I mentioned uh, should be conducted in a sustainable manner through effectively managed and equitably governed areas. And the EU often very uh, often stresses the recognition of the rights of the indigenous peoples and the local communities and refers to international um, human rights law. In general, the EU uh, has to speak with one, one voice. Um, so the views of the presidency should not be that unique um, compared to the EU as such. Uh, but I guess what is a bit specific is that during the Czech presidency, a lot of attention has been given to the EU nature restoration law uh, and also quite recently to regulation which aims to prevent commodity driven deforestation and forest degradation in selected supply chains of the EU. And this may perhaps translate to a more confident EU position as it may seem that the EU is doing a lot at home, um, that it is doing its, its biodiversity homework and uh, simply um, walk the talk. And uh, very shortly, perhaps, I'd like to mention that since um, one of the Czech uh, presidency's priorities is to help Ukraine and, and the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine, um, I know that Czechia advocates uh, that Russia is held accountable to the, for the damages to the, bio, to the biodiversity and, and ecosystems um, in Ukraine. Um, and Czechia also cooperates a lot with countries in the Central and Eastern European region and tries to act as a bridge builder 
um, to create partnership and ownership. So we hear more and more than biodiversity and climate change are interconnected issues and that, that there are two battles that must be fought together. Um, so I would like to have your take on this, David, to know how would we benefit from better synergies between the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UNFCCC on climate change? So first of all, I think it, it's very clear climate change drives biodiversity loss. So that is that is one very clear and direct link. Another very important link is that the people affected by biodiversity loss and the people affected by climate change, if they are driven towards negative coping behavior, in the end, it worsens the effects of, of those two processes. It can even it can even contribute to biodiversity loss and even to 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 climate change. Um, if those people who are affected by the worst effects of biodiversity loss and climate change are not involved in the solutions. And if their rights and livelihoods are affected by measures taken to prevent biodiversity loss and climate change, we will not go anywhere either regarding the CBD or the, the UNFCCC. And then also we should not forget the third convention, uh, the UNCCD on, on desertification and, and soil erosion. Um, actually, there at the Conference of the Parties, very significant progress was made regarding the recognition of tenure rights and generally uh, building on rights-based approaches as crucial factors to achieve the Convention's objectives. And I think for the CBD and the FCCC, we need very similar recognition of basic rights, especially, but not only obviously, tenure rights of people who are affected by climate change and by biodiversity loss. If this as a basis for the implementation of the conventions can be achieved, then I think the, the synergies will also very naturally become visible. You're right, we should not forget the third convention, uh, even though it's much less talked about. I have one final question for you both um, that will act as a conclusion to this podcast. I would like to know if you would have one or two words to describe a good outcome of the COP uh, in your perspective. So maybe you want to start, Romana. So for me, it would be perhaps fair and up to the task. So if it's supposed to be towards, then um, let's say fair and effective. Yeah, the word that frequently pops up in my head is energy or energizing, because we already said that maybe we will not get the agreement that we hope for at the end of this COP, but I hope that we really get out of this COP with the energy to say, OK, we're nearly there. Let's continue the efforts and let's make it happen. This has been a great discussion. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you to our speakers, David and Romana, for sharing their thoughts and expertise with us. Uh, if you would like to read more about the core policies linked to sustainability and biodiversity, IEP work and its network, Think Sustainable Europe, you can check our website at iep.eu. Thank you very much, David and Romana, for your insights. And thank you all for listening to this podcast. Thank you.